So Rob, thank you for joining me today. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Uh, my name is Rob Nelson. I am a content creator, I suppose, but I'm a biologist originally. And so I'm trying to constantly teach people about the wonderful world that is all around us. Very cool. So like, what inspired your love and fascination with nature? Um, so I grew up in Texas and I, I had, you know, a life in the city, but then we also had a lake house where we'd spend a lot of our time. And I remember distinctly sometime, you know, from about fifth grade onwards, sitting on the dock of our lake and looking into the water and wondering what was under there. And because, you know, you can't really see under a lake and occasionally if you're fishing, you pull up a fish now and then. But once you look closer, you look and you see all of these little organisms and then there's little minnows that feed on those little organisms. And I was just really curious about what was happening. Um, and so that was that was kind of where it all began for me in high school. I was one of those kids that had about let's see what did I have six, six big tanks of uh, fish in my room. So I was a big <laughs> fish nut. And I enjoyed uh, learning about fish and constantly going to the pet stores. So whenever my parents would go to Walmart, I'd go to the pet store across the street and I'd say, just come get me when you're ready. Um, and so that's kind of where it all began. Ended up from there, ended up becoming a marine scientist. And it was just all, it was constant curiosity was basically how it worked for me from an early age. Very cool. Well, um, I read your book and it's entitled uh, Mother Nature is Not Trying to Kill You. Um, so I, I was really drawn to the title. Um, tell us a little bit about the book and whether or not Mother Nature is really trying to kill us or not. <laughs> well, it's so so titles are hard. And oh, yeah. Yeah. I, it could have been a lot of different titles. Uh, one of the titles could have been How to Survive Anything That Nature Throws You. That that could have been a good title too. The, the publishers suggested that it should be let's title it "Mother Nature is Trying to Kill You." But because I was a biologist, I couldn't I couldn't do that name because my peers would kill me. Because right. As a biologist, you're constantly <laughs> like fielding questions from your parents and your aunts and uncles, and they say, "Hey, look at this snake we just killed. What is it? What is it? Is it going to kill us?" And so you're always playing the role as a biologist of saying, no, don't worry. It's not trying to kill you. It was a mistaken identity. Don't worry. That rattlesnake's not trying to kill you. But, you know, with the book, it's there's a lot of exceptions, mm -hmm. but also not a ton when you look worldwide. Like when you think sure. about it, there's not a lot of animals that are actually trying to kill you so trying being the key word those would be mega predators that have humans on the menu those things would be lions and tigers um, mm -hmm. some bears particularly polar bears crocodiles there's not many of those uh, some of the crocodilians uh, maybe one or two different snake species would try to kill humans um, and occasional sharks but that's that's the list right yeah there. that's it mm -hmm. everything else is maybe trying to defend itself more than mm -hmm. try to kill you and eat you and have you on the menu. So the reason I wrote the book is, you know, here's a whole list of animals that could kill you. If you understand a little bit about the biology of those animals, why they're in the environment doing the things that they're doing, then you can make sure you don't get killed. Yeah. And right? that's so just understanding those behaviors because most of them are poisonous, but probably not to kill you. So just to right. avoid that behavior, you're going to be okay. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, if, as long as I stay out of uh, like the savannah to avoid the lions and the tigers, I'm probably going to be okay. I don't ever think I'm going to find myself <laughs> with a polar bear unless something yeah. really bad goes wrong at the zoo. Um, <laughs> so, you know, those are, those are kind of comforting to know the gaining yeah, well, that knowledge. Those are two and interesting examples, the polar bear and the savannas, because polar bears have to eat everything. So mm. definitely stay away from polar bear country unless you're well equipped everybody i know that goes into polar bear country is heavily armed <laughs> that's one thing to know if you're going right into not so bad if you're going into other bear country but then the savannas that is a habitat that um humans have been in for a long time every animal in the savanna is well adept to defend itself from humans and or kill humans so that's different than North America. That's different than South America. It's different than Australia. Um, so you do have to know your habitat. 
Right. And that's something that we talk about a lot on my show, usually in dealing with humans and human environments, mm. but your environment can dictate what the real threats are. And so you make, you make a really good point with a polar bear. It's like, it's got to eat everything because there's nothing else out there. If it wants to survive, it's got to eat. And it's not personal. It's not like, oh, there's a human. I'm going to go take that guy out because I don't like what he said on Twitter. It's, it's a primal thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, polar bears are also incredible to understand, mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're the mega predator and they have incredible noses and they eat everything. I mean, yeah. they will, they will eat, they eat mostly uh, meat. Um, but occasionally if they have to, they'll do little things like eggs, bird eggs, or sometimes berries, but um, not much. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, and they're the they're the biggest baddest predator, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, and I I will I will not disagree with you on that. Um, <laughs> so as you know, we, we have people listening here, and they're thinking about going hiking this summer and maybe going camping. Give us an overview, and, and, and most of my audience here is in North America to help you right. kind of pin it in. Yep, yep. What is it that we really need to look out for? You know, when we're out camping and hiking with their families. Um, well, I think. I think the thing to understand um, with in, in North America, there, there is some regionality, um, you know, depending on if you're in the West, there you have some bears. Mm -hmm. um, but in the East, you probably have to be most careful. Uh, uh, well, oh, people always talk about snakes. They're, they're mm -hmm. there, but it, it's really ticks. Oh, ticks. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It's, it's really the insects that you would probably need to be most concerned with. I don't actually have a chapter on ticks because the parasitology and all of the things that come with insect-borne diseases is a whole book. Oh, I'm sure that it is. one you might yeah. actually title "Mother Nature is Trying to Kill You" if you're like <laughs> associating parasites and stuff. And then even parasites are not actually trying to kill you; they just want to suck as much out of you as possible, but not kill you. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I think the other thing that's really important to understand is. While animals could be potentially problematic for people in the wild, it's also unpreparedness from the elements, mm. I think, mm -hmm. is, is the biggest problem that most people face. Uh, not going out, having enough water, not going out, letting people know where you are, and then getting into, you know, breaking a leg or something, and then you're stuck, not bringing some sort of emergency device to signal. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things it's and that's why I wrote the book particularly with that title is that I feel like a lot of people think that nature is what's going to do you in which could be a broad term you know when you talk about mother nature like it's everything in the wild but when you're specifically thinking animals I, I don't think that's the world that we're in right at the moment mm -hmm. um, it's not the snake that's going to do you in it's not the lion or mountain lion that's going to do you in it's probably more your own stupidity going out there and being unprepared got it and and that makes sense it's um you know humans were different to you know we're used to different environments we're used to like home depot and you know our office building and right. a lot of us think that oh hey you know i can just go out and walk around in in the woods here and it'll be totally fine and then you end up you know going out on a day where it's going to have you're going to have a snowstorm or something like that and all of a sudden everything changes on you um, you brought up snakes a minute ago, and I know a lot of people are afraid of snakes. Even when somebody puts a picture of snakes on Facebook, people get scared of seeing it on their phones. Right. So if I'm out on a trail and I come across a snake, what is my best course of action? Um, well, the most important thing probably is to not freak out, hmm. right? Because um, if you just stop and freeze, we don't have many very aggressive snakes in the u.s mm -hmm. okay i hesitate to say none <laughs> I'm, right, I'm comparing sure. them worldwide you know there's some snakes like black mambas they will chase you down and they yeah. are uh not a snake you want to be very close to and they're very 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 deadly um the and we have water moccasins which mm -hmm. are kind of pissy snakes and if you're in the water sometimes they just go at you i don't know it's weird yeah um I think it's uh, it's important for people to understand that the threat level of snakes, particularly in the U.S., is relatively low. Mm -hmm. And so that can be the first thing to help calm you down. You can understand that 
even though you're watching Discovery Channel and they talk about how deadly things are, you know, snake wise and how quickly you can die, that's not true for North American snakes. You can go to the doctor after getting bit by a snake and you're like the chances of having a death from that is is almost zero. Okay. Because, because there's a lot you can do to treat that snake bite. It's, it's not as bad as people think. Okay. Um, and so, so that's one thing. The second thing is most people are going to get bit trying to deal with the snake. Just walk away and you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and you see that all the time. Most of the people that get bit are trying to kill a, a rattlesnake. They're trying to, they're not, but it's not because they're randomly walking through the woods and they step on it. Right. Snake, snakes will let you know they're there mm -hmm. often. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the, best thing for people to remember and, and then i think so your snake encounters really vary between are you encountering a snake at home or are you encountering it out in the woods on a hiking trail and there's mm -hmm. different things to think of there um i think everybody can probably agree that you don't want venomous snakes around your home yeah so but at the same time i i think it's it's worthwhile to understand that when you're hiking in the wild you're going to have venomous snakes mm -hmm. So you're going to just walk away in the wild, but when you're at the home, you're going to want to take a few extra measures to make sure that those encounters don't happen again and again, and that you deal with that snake. And the best thing that people can do, um, because I'm anticipating a follow-up question, <laughs> or maybe it's just <laughs> worthwhile noting here, is to deal with your rat problem, yeah. or your mouse problem, or sure. your vermin problem, because the only reason snakes are there is because there's food sources. And so you have to make sure if you have chickens or you have any sort of grain or things around the house. I mean, a lot of people do. It's not, a mm -hmm. lot of people in this society don't, but make sure those are away. And also make sure you have no hiding spaces for snakes. So like sure. lots of debris around your house. So right. just cleaning up is a real simple solution to just make sure you can live harmon harmoniously with the animals too. Right. So just don't attract them is, is a good thing. I always grew up hearing, uh, especially living in the Southeast, that if you actually had a black snake in your area, that was actually kind of a good thing because it, it did take care of. And we actually had a black snake in our yard a few years ago. I just left him. And the only, the only real issue we had was the dog would come and bark at it. And I didn't want the dog to get bit. So it was kind of like, okay, I'll usher you off of my property here, but I want you to stay around because you provide a good service for my house and the houses that surround us. Oh, a hundred percent. And, you know, we, <clears throat> I live in Charlotte. Um, you're very close to me here in the area. What people call black snakes is one of two things. It's either a black rat snake. Mm -hmm. I'm just clarifying because. Sure, please do. Yeah, because I didn't don't know. call them black snakes. Um, and then there's like a black racer and they're very similar looking. But yeah, both of those snakes are completely harmless to humans. Even if your dog get bit, it would got bit, it wouldn't be a problem. The only thing that would be a problem is if your dog started getting into the habit of trying to attack snakes and then right. tried biting a venomous one. So you mm. I want to train the dogs to stay away from the snakes. But yeah, they'll take care of your rep and uh, mouse problem. Right. Uh, so they're actually really good to have. And and I like, you know, I have two boys. I have an eight-year-old and an uh, an 11-year-old today. He's a, He just turned 11. Oh, very cool. <laughs> um. I try to make the habit of as soon as I see snakes, going up to the snakes and observing them. Mm -hmm. Now I have a little bit more knowledge, so I can sure right if a venomous or non-venomous snake. Um, but especially with those black snakes, the black rat snakes, we'll go up to them. I'll pick them up, but you can also just observe them, watch them, and I think it's good to teach kids um, that you don't have to be scared of all of those things mm -hmm. because we we as humans have an innate fear of snakes. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. I feel like it's ingrained in our DNA, so to speak. You know, it goes back to um, our ancestors long ago. It was the biggest threat. Yeah, sure, was sure. Venomous snakes, especially um, uh, in, in places like Africa where it is a huge threat. Asia, it's a huge threat. Not so much in North America, but... Um, yeah, I think you can learn to uh, not be as scared, and then you're more empowered when you're in the wild next time. Yeah, man, I, I completely agree with you. And so I'm sure you've answered this question a hundred times uh, as a biologist. What's something that we need to look for in a snake to know whether it is venomous or not? Okay, that is a very easy question if you're in North America. 
Okay. So I'll answer that, but then I'll add a little caveat in case you're in other places. The In North America, um, we really have one main class of venomous snakes, and those are vipers. Mm -hmm. Vipers have triangular heads. Um, so they, their venom is kind of here, uh, and that, that makes their heads a little more triangular shaped. But a defining feature of vipers is they have slits in their eyes, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of snakes have uh, round circular eyes like we do. Right? Okay. Slits being like cat-like eyes. Right. However, everybody probably also knows there's coral snakes. Coral mm -hmm. snakes are the brightly red, yellow, black snakes. Those are a different group of snakes. Um, those snakes have round eyes too. So it's vipers plus coral snakes in the US. Okay. You recognize a coral snake and you can recognize the viper eye slit, then you know what a venomous snake is. Now, coral snakes belong to elapids, which is a worldwide group of snakes. And they also include black mambas, they mm. include the, um, all of the Australian deadly snakes, like the king browns and all of the dangerous snakes there meaning that the world's most dangerous snakes don't have slits in their eyes so if you're mm. in asia or australia okay. you can't use the eye thing that that whole eye thing that everybody talks about is really only a north american thing gotcha so when in doubt just leave it alone yeah 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 if you if you definitely are in doubt leave it alone um but I always encourage people to try to start learning as much as they mm -hmm. can because the world opens up to you once you understand which ones are venomous and which ones aren't, and then you can not be as scared. Very cool. Uh, speaking of you know, opening up your mind and learning new stuff, mm -hmm. I learned something uh, from your book, and it was about wolves. I mm -hmm. always thought that wolves were, as you're, as you're calling it, like a mega predator, especially being in a pack that if they saw a human out on the trail or, you know, something like that, but they would just, you know, go for the human and attack it. But that's right. not necessarily the case. No, that's not necessarily the case. So this is really fascinating. And I learned a lot researching this as well. So wolves um, are predators and mm -hmm. they have a unique, they're, they're unique dogs in that they form packs. And mm -hmm. we all have seen the documentaries and they're, they're fascinating. Um, but, he, well, here's the thing. I, I feel like there's two ways of viewing wolves. There's the traditional way that we were taught from our grandparents and our parents that wolves are extremely dangerous and they're out to kill you. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I kind of got taught a slightly different view. And that's probably growing up in the 90s and, and 2000s from watching National Geographic and the mm -hmm. whole the activist movement and then being a biologist. And that's that wolves are actually completely misunderstood and that they're not going to kill anybody, right? And doing the research for the book, my goal was really to, to suss out what is the science? You know, mm -hmm. is it one or the other, or is it somewhere in the middle? And with wolves, it's somewhere in the middle because mm -hmm. there is a difference between European wolves and North American wolves. So many of the stories that we have inherited come from our European ancestors and wolves are more dangerous in Europe. Okay. Yeah, than they are in North America. So we have lots of stories that, that originate and kind of have the wolf as the, the big, bad, terrible thing that is sure. in the story. Okay. And, and if you go back, and, and I found this was really fascinating, there are records of wolf attacks. Uh, the best kept records are from France, and they have almost mm -hmm. five thousand wolf deaths. Um, from I forget, I forget, I forget the details. It was like the last four hundred years. Oh my gosh! Five thousand attacks from wolves in France uh, that have killed people, and that's actually a lot, right? Yeah, that that's that's quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. And you have to understand, of course, too, that does does not suss out rabies. And a rabid wolf. Sure. A rabid wolf sure. is an extremely dangerous wolf. A rabid animal in general is a really dangerous right. animal. And um, a lot of scientists will say that's probably one of the things that was accounting for all of these deaths. And then there's a lot of deaths in Asia still, mostly from rabies, which we should talk about. The the wolf adventure I went on a little at, right after this. Oh, yeah, I'm going to. Yeah. <laughs> it's very... <laughs> so, um, but but just if you think about it from uh, how long wolves have been associated with people, so you, wolves are are um, attacking 
uh, herbivores mostly. That's, okay. that's kind of what they're doing. Humans came into the picture in Europe. Humans learned to, or wolves learned to associate with people and form this give and take relationship. Like a wolf doesn't want to get killed, but it also wants to you know, eat. And so it, it's understanding and passing on through its genes how it relates to humans. North America didn't have humans as long. Right, right. right. And Native Americans have very a very different relationship with wolves. They don't have wolves as the enemy in their stories. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's there's almost no stories that people, from what I would could read, could do that. And um, we brought the story of the wolf as the big bad enemy of the forest with us, and that was not a North American thing. So if you're hiking in the woods anywhere in North America, for the most part, you're completely safe. Occasionally, cool. you'll hear a story or two, um, often from hunters. Um, but I think you, you have to take those with a grain of salt because we don't have European wolves. We have North American gray wolves and there can be dangerous, but as long as you're taking some basic precautions, like don't, you know, let your little five-year-old go walking with you right. or your 10-year-old. They're a little more prey looking than mm-hmm. human. Right. Um, don't bring a dog with you is another mm-hmm. one because the dog actually could be eaten and they're going to attract that wolf to you. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a good point. Um, right. yeah, there's, uh, that was long. I apologize. No, that was, no, like, that, that was, was good. interesting. And then I was like, I don't know if I've explained it quite like this before. I'm just trying to get it out there. Right. And, and it makes sense because it's always, it was kind of passed down, I guess, from generation to generation as people from Europe moved to North America that, oh yeah, wolves are bad. But then you, you made a great point here with native Americans were like, no, they, they honored the wolf and, and I'm not a, I'm not a historian in Native American history or culture sure. at all, but even I know that that like Native Americans appreciate the wolf, and that's a very good point to bring up. So I'll ask you. I read this in your book. Um, I, I will need to ask you what on earth you were thinking, but apparently, at one point, you were tasked to go look for aggressive, potentially radioactive wolves in Chernobyl. Why did you say yes to that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, if somebody asked you that, would you like to go to Chernobyl and look for wolves? How could you say no? Because that yeah. is fascinating. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I was, we were, I was part of a documentary that was going to look at life after the Chernobyl incident. And this right. was to mark the 30 year anniversary for what mm-hmm. happened in Chernobyl. So that was 86 was the event. And so for 2016 is when we went and did that. And that has not been 30 years, sir. Your math is terribly off. <laughs> I feel I still feel like 20 years ago was 1980. So that's that's where that comes from. <laughs> yeah. Well, now it's much past that. There's we're like 35 years past. I know, that. I know. <laughs> um uh and so we were just trying to figure out what's happening to the life uh, on, uh that's there. And one of the most popular stories that had come out of Ukraine at that time was that there were some aggressive wolves that were attacking people. Mm -hmm. And we went there to use that as a hook to tell a bigger story. And because I had a background as a biologist and um, doing behavioral ecology, and I wasn't a wolf specialist, but I kind of was able to look at the wolves as part of it. We went and told this story, and it was really fascinating to go into this exclusion zone that kind of comes from our legends of the place and howl for wolves in the middle of the night and have them howl back at you and it was just an, a, and it was an amazing experience because it felt in many ways like you were in a video game <laughs> okay because you know like you, this is the stories you know it's like james bond type stories mm-hmm. You're in Eastern Russia, you get through all of this military encampment, and then you're in abandoned cities where the cities are basically nestled within a forest that's grown up through them. And then you have wolves howling in the background. And so it was a great backdrop for what was really a fascinating story. And I will say this, that um, the conclusion to that was actually that it was rabid wolves. Okay, so rabies. It, it was some wolves that had contracted rabies and then were being more aggressive to people. So the myths that seem to be perpetuated now about a radioactive, aggressive wolves is actually not true. Okay. So I have to just make sure that that gets out there because the documentary, I wasn't the editor on it. It didn't quite highlight that feature. It a little bit left it up for, Okay. a little bit left it hanging. Okay. Very cool. Um, 
what's the name of the documentary? Because I have to admit, I, I kind of want to watch it myself. Yeah, no, it's it's, a, it's, it's really a good one. It's um, it's on Animal Planet. It's called Life After uh, Chernobyl. Okay. Life After Chernobyl. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I there, recommend everyone to watch it. It's a good one. Yeah. So there's there's not um, glow in the dark wolves that have lasers for eyes and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, Slightly disappointing there, Rob. No, and Slightly actually, this this is this is interesting to note because a lot of people are is another thing people are afraid of is nuclear energy mm -hmm. this is just a pitch to say as bad as chernobyl was and it was very bad the worst mm -hmm. nuclear disaster that had ever happened and hopefully will ever happen 400 times the amount of nuclear radiation from uh than hiroshima uh 30 years later given that we more or less left the area the wildlife has recovered and there are mm -hmm. still rates of mutations, but things can recover. And that's a positive sign. And I think mm -hmm. we should all see it that way. And it's uh, pretty cool. Whoops. Well, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, this isn't necessarily the goal uh, of my podcast, but I know my, my listener's interest is peaked. Mine is peaked. Just walking around Chernobyl, seeing that, yeah, humans were here. It kind of looks like they just left. But now there's trees and vines and everything that's taking over. Kind of, kind of tell us a little bit about what it was like when you walked in for the first time and, and took a look around. Well, so just to set this up, um, Chernobyl is in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine, of course, is in the news right now. Right. Uh, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, so it was like very Eastern Bloc type thing. Um, there's an exclusion zone set up around the reactors. So there's four nuclear reactors. Reactor number four is the one that exploded. Um, there's a, a, a 10 mile and a 30 mile or kilometer exclusion zone. And different people are allowed in. They're, they check people to make sure that your radiation levels don't go above a certain amount. So everybody wears a certain thing that collects your radiation, and then you turn that in afterwards. And you also wear Geiger counters, essentially personal decimeters. You enter the exclusion zones through um, a lot of military. So you feel like you're going back in time to the 1980s. Sure. You sure. feel like you're going into the Soviet Union. It's insanity. And all of the equipment, as you're going through these checkpoints, feels like you're in the 80s again. I mean, it's mm. dilapidated. It's like you're back in Stranger Things. You yeah, know, the yeah. Way it feels like the way everything works is all mechanical. There's not a lot of electronics with you know, touch screens, so it's it feels quite ancient and rusty. But then, as soon as you pass into the exclusion zone, I don't know what I was expecting, but I did not expect it to look like a national park. I see, hmm. you see, that's what it felt like because okay, all of the infrastructure had started to fall to pieces and. There were not a lot of power lines alongside the roads. So you're kind of driving and it's just green off to the sides. Um, nobody is maintaining the vegetation. And so any houses that in villages that were kind of in the sides of this exclusion zone, it's a 30, 30 kilometer radius. So it's quite mm -hmm. a large area. The forest has grown up into it. So you're driving through this forest with big fields that have, you know, wild horses are maintaining the pastures, mm. not, you know, anything that people are doing. So there's, you're not witnessing human civilizations. You're witnessing what feels like a national park. So okay. you're seeing some animals, you're seeing old houses within the forest, like little nooks and crannies. And then occasionally, you, well, so we went into the city of Pripyat. Pripyat is the feeder city to the nuclear reactor it housed Gosh, I want to say it was like 50,000 people, mm. some skyscrapers and stuff. But you enter Pripyat and you enter a forest with skyscrapers popping up through it, right? <laughs> so you're driving down these roads, but you're kind of having to zigzag because there's, you know, birch trees popping up through the roads. And it's the most fascinating thing ever. And I, I really enjoyed going to what felt like a post-apocalyptic city mm -hmm. from a movie and just seeing it in real life and things being quiet and serene it was really neat. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So you've done a lot of stuff uh, around the world. You've, you've been in all sorts of environments. Um, tell us about a time where things kind of went a little sideways and you had to use your survival skills uh, to make it out. Well, yeah, uh, that's a good question. I would say most of the time, 
my real goal is to try not to get into a survival situation. <laughs> sure, absolutely. We understand <laughs> so, that. On so this I have show. relatively few stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say my very first story is that I had a shipwreck at sea and had to get rescued. And so I suppose it was my survival skills, but it was also a little bit of dumb luck. I was, <laughs> I basically didn't look at the weather and I got myself in way over my head, sailed into the storm of the decade. Ugh. That's what they were calling it on the news later that day and couldn't get in. My boat threw me off with my partner on it. Um, my partner was able to hold on for a little while until the boat got flipped end over end in a wave smashed to pieces um, i swam for about an hour and a half in the waves until i grabbed mm -hmm. the last buoy out to sea and then i pounded sos on a buoy and uh, eventually four hours after that the coast guard came well it was, actually it was the navy the navy base right on shore mm -hmm. came out and got me with like a wave rescue jet ski thing it was intense yeah i suppose like i knew sos so that was mm -hmm. a survival skill not sure they heard my SOS, but the person that I was with floated into shore and told people were, that I was still out there. So, whew. yeah, very cool, man. That's crazy. That's crazy. And that is in your book. So if you want to read Rob's book, uh, that's there at the very beginning. It goes into uh, some details about it. But yeah, man, that sounds that sounds nuts. So um, since you appreciate nature so much uh, and you're a dad, what do you want families to know about the nature that's around them? Well, I think it's really important for people to understand that nature is not something that's in a faraway place. It's not something that is only in the movies that you're going to have to take a big trip to. You don't have to go to the Amazon to see nature. It's all around us all the time. And we are part of it, right? So we're like, it's not us versus nature. That's, that's what I'm trying to get away from mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. I want people to understand that if we want a beautiful nature or if we want wild uh, native thriving ecosystems where we live we can create it you can do it yourself in your own backyard and once you've created your little backyard maybe you can get your neighbors to start doing the same thing too and it's just so many people feel like they have to be extremely equipped to like go on hikes you know they're bringing all of the gear all the time but I just want people to start small and start appreciating what's just immediately around them and and being a a positive influence for the things there because i think that's what we need we need more people interacting with nature we don't need more people scared of nature that's why i couldn't mm -hmm. say mother nature is trying to kill you because i don't want that idea out there even though occasionally you know you got you got to contend with a few things <laughs> sure very good so rob uh, i know people are going to want to know more about you um where can they find you um well, if you're on social, I go by Untamed Science. And if you're on YouTube, I have a YouTube uh, channel called Stone Age Man. And that basically encompasses all of what I do. That's the new, the new thing now, because I think we're the idea of understanding what our uh, Stone Age past understood is important. And then we can also move forward from that. So that's the idea. Very cool. Um, do you have anything on this on Discovery Plus right now that maybe families could sit down and watch at dinner time or something? Um, I think Life After Chernobyl, which mm -hmm. is the doc we did, is on Discovery Plus. Uh, and then I also think that the Science Channel docs that I did, uh, Secrets of the Underground, which mm -hmm. was two, two years that I did a show there, is also on Discovery Plus. Very cool, Rob. Hey, man, thank you for, for your time. I appreciate it. The, the book is available on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Buddy, I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Sandy. Take care.